Branch Baptist Church. We trust and hope that you're doing well, and we just want to welcome you to another one of our services. And if you are watching this and you aren't a part of our church, we want to welcome you as well. Um, we're always welcoming newcomers. Obviously, it's going to be different welcoming newcomers as instead of welcoming them, uh, instead of wel welcoming them inside the church. We're welcoming them as we as they watch our video. But we're glad that everyone's here, ready to worship the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to give Him all the glory, whether it's through preaching. Uh, through Pastor Alex, uh, where it's our worship, um, your worship at home. We're just already here to give the glory to God. Uh, one thing that we used to do when we met in the, um, in the sanctuary was that we would have a quiet time of prayer just to prepare our hearts and to prepare our mind for the service that we're going to be giving to the Lord, for the sacrifice and the praise we're going to be giving to the Lord. So let's just take some time to, to do this now. And then I, as as you guys are praying silently, I will jump in and have a, an opening prayer for all of us. So let's just pray silently together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you in this way. Um, what we pray for right now, Lord, is we pray for unity for our church. We pray for unity for everyone watching this video. Um, people, people are most likely watching the service at different times. Um, or watch, uh, they're watching it maybe um, in their, or everyone separately in their separate homes, sometimes within the same home or what we're watching it at different times. But Lord, we pray for unity right now. We pray for our church to have that unity that is only provided through your Holy Spirit. Allow us to come together and to worship you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to give you all the glory as we sing praises to you. As we sing about your love, about your mercy, about your grace, about your gospel. Um, Lord, help us to be solely focused on you during this time. And we pray for those who are hurting right now. We pray for those who are going through so many things, which might be a lot of us because of COVID-19. Heavenly Father, I just pray that um, all, those, all those burdens all these unanswered questions that we have. Allow us to lay those at your feet right now so that way we can worship you with, with empty hands. We pray this, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Amen. So again, we do want to welcome you to our service. And if you were watching the five-minute countdown that we had, you saw the prelude and meditation for this service, which was uh, Psalm 46, verse 10, which reads, Be still and know that I am God. And that verse, <clears throat> many of us use it as a reflection verse, uh, a time reflection where, where we say we can go anywhere, we can go into the stillness, we can go into the quiet times and sense that God is there and have a better understanding of who God is. And that can be true as well, but within the context of that psalm, it gives us such a more uh, rich understanding of who God is and and the place he has in our lives. And it's so, so applicable to us today. I just want to read Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3, where it reads, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their singing, with, with their surging. And then we come to verse 10 where it says, he says, be still and know I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And I just pray that this is where we are this morning. That in a time, especially with COVID, where there's so many different struggles, so many different things that we have to conquer, the gut reaction for most people is to say, if there's a problem, I'm going to overcome it. I'm going to challenge it, and I'm going to beat this. And so many times we have failed time and time again, realizing that our strength is not enough. And I pray that during this time, during this worship service, during our lives, during this week, we're able to remember that the Lord is our strength. The Bible talks about the joy of the Lord is our strength, the joy that we have in our relationship with Christ, the joy that we have in our relationship with God day in and day out is the strength that we have to go through each and every single day, to tackle every single situation. 
So I just pray that no matter what we're going through right now, help us to focus on this relationship right now, focusing on this relationship that provides us strength and energy for every single day. So I just pray that if you're with me right now, let us come to worship God together, give him the praise that he deserves, and to give him all the honor and glory. Let's, let's sing together.
Hello, Long Branch family. I'm excited to talk to you once again. It's been a while. Thank you for the years of support, the years of love, especially to our family. We are very grateful and we say may God bless you all. We also thank God that we all survived the pandemic and uh, we are looking forward to a brighter day, a brighter future. We pray that we shall be stable once again and everything will come back to normal. Just want to say hi. Just want to say I miss you and I love you all. Bye. God bless you. Hello, my church family at Long Branch Baptist Church in Toronto. It's really an honor coming to you and reaching to you through this means. It's been an amazing year. Amazing, an amazing year. Many things have changed, as I'm sure that you have witnessed. Many things will remain changed, will never go back to the same way it was. A year that will be marked by the pandemic of uh, coronavirus. A year that will be marked with so many changes, so many dynamics that have cropped up, both in our homes, our families, our church, and our ministries. A lot of good things have happened, a lot of bad things have also happened. But it's really an honor to be alive, to have survived this period, and I want to thank God for all of you as well for having survived this. I want to thank you especially for your support and your prayers for our ministry here in Nigeria and for my family. God bless you immensely. Thank you for praying for accommodation. Uh, December this year will be the end of the two years that we paid in advance for the accommodation. And we are, we are looking up to God to provide for the other year and the other year, Lord willing. And also thank you for praying and supporting our vehicle, the uh, um, changing of the engine and of, of our vehicle. That he loves has been an amazing journey. In fact, it has saved us, it's still helping us. We are using it in moving and it's been helping the ministry. Thank you so very much for your support all these years. And thank you that, that you prayed for us, you stood by us, even during this uh, pandemic. It was a short down period. We couldn't do more because everywhere was on a lockdown. For four months, we were asked to sit in one place, just that we were coming to the office, keep the office going. Our missionaries in the villages were also going on evangelism, but we couldn't do any outreach. We couldn't do any open air programs because there were a limited number of people that could gather at a place for a short time. So it kept us at least not being able to do enough or doing a lot as our hearts would have wanted. Our schools were shut down, our churches were shut down as well. Our office was shut down for about a month or so before we began again. But we thank God that in all this, God has been faithful. God continues to ask souls that, um, that we are saved, or that are saved through the ministry of our missionaries. God continues to rescue and deliver also souls from the bondage of darkness. God has been doing amazing things in our mission field. Thank you for your praying. So many events, so many accidents took place, and so many tragic events took place. But in all of this, the name of the Lord was glorified. We saw God moving in this manner and in these ways. So thank you so very much. I had thought I would be there in person to greet you and to see you this year, but here we are with coronavirus. But hopefully next year, God willing, we might be able to see face to face or whenever the Lord makes it possible. I just want to say thank you so very much. Thank you for our ministry and thank you from our ministry. Thank you from my family and thank you for from the church worldwide. God has been amazingly wonderful to us through your prayers and support. God bless you. With that video um, of of our missionaries of all across the world, and that's just something we we have to remember to be in prayer for. It's not just for our situation. COVID nineteen has affected so many different ministries, so many different countries all around the world. So it's always important to remember. Let's have everyone in prayer during this time. Uh, I just want to go through a couple of announcements before we get into our scripture reading and our prayer. Um, we just want to give you an update on Andrew, and he is feeling much better. He's he's continuing to recover. But just continue to have him, Sveta, and Leah in your prayers. Um, we we want to lift up Tanya in our in our midst right now. Uh, Tanya was a was actually one of the first converts, I believe, when um, when coronavirus happened. Um, she was she was a very new believer during coronavirus, and we just want to pray for her. But we also want to pray for her son Tyler, as he had to go to the hospital to to get some blood work done, 
and there's some issues with his, uh, with his white, I think it's his white blood cell count. So just continue to have him in prayer and really pray for that situation. Um, one update on the men's meeting that was supposed to be happening next week, Saturday. Um, the, the, the leaders of that ministry will be giving you an email sometime throughout the week to confirm when that meeting is going to be. Um, there's a chance it might be moved, but it, it is not 100% certain yet. So we will give you an, an, an update about that, mis- sorry, about that ministry um, through an email throughout the week. So just be, just be on the lookout for that if you are a man who is looking to come to that. Uh, also keep in mind that, that if you're looking to sign up, it's only 10, there's only 10 spots available because of the, of, of the restrictions that, that have been placed upon the church. So just remember, just remember to keep that in mind. Um, we also want to pray for Catherine Truen as her daughter and then her son-in-law have had COVID during this time. So just, just continue to keep them in prayer. Um, an update for some of the ministries that, that have been going on around the church. There's been the Mandarin group. There's been the youth, uh, the youth ministry that's been meeting online. Uh, the young adults meeting, um, which has been going online as well. Sorry, which has been going in person, I should say. And it's been a blessing to have newcomers actually come to that, to, to that meeting as well, which has been really good. Uh, so, but just continue to have all those ministries uh, in your prayers. Uh, because right now, because of COVID, so many different uh, things that we need to handle, so many different protocols that we have to remember to follow and to ensure safety, but also pray for, for God to work in those ministries as well. Um, I just, let me just bring the scripture reading to you guys for today. Uh, the scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. I'll we'll give you some time to find it in your Bibles. And it reads, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was bur- uh, uh, buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and on that day he appeared to Cephas and, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Amen. Let us, let us all go to prayer um, before the Lord as we continue our service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for the God and the Father that you are. We're so thankful that when things happen, when situations, uh, the big situations, the small situations, when they arise, we know that you are there. We know that you are with us. We're so thankful, Lord, that you are a God who listens to us and hears our cries. And we cry out to you this morning. We cry out to you during this time, whenever we're watching this video. Um, We just want to pray for the COVID-19 situation, Lord, and just how big it's gotten and how many cases there are, the number of cases. Um, we pray for those who have been out of work and then they have to be at home with uh, their, their kids who might be doing school from home. So many different situations, Lord, are arising. We just need wisdom during this time. We need wisdom in order to know exactly what to do. We need wisdom to know what the best situations are, to choose from, from, uh, from different paths, one or the other. Lord, we pray for the government right now. Give them wisdom as well as they deal with tough situations. Um, it's not easy to say to so many businesses that you're not allowed to open your business. It's not easy for them to say to people who, who as people were designed to be in relationship and to be with one another. It's hard for them to say you cannot hang out with other people. You cannot spend time with your family. You cannot spend time with your sick mother or your sick father who's in the hospital. Lord, we just pray for depression and mental health during this time, especially 
as it grows close to Christmas. Christmas is already a time where um, mental health skyrockets and suicides skyrocket. And then now coupled with that, with, uh, with COVID-19, Lord, we're not sure what the situation, we don't, we're not sure what the situation will be in the next month, but we know that you know. And Lord, help us to come to you for comfort. It's one thing for you to offer comfort to us. It's one thing for you to say that you will take away our anxieties, that you will, that you will help us with our fears. But Lord, help us to come to you to find peace, to find refuge. Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones during this time. We think of Michael, who's in our midst, who lost his grandfather. And um, we think of those who have lost loved ones as well recently, and just the situation that that entails because of COVID-19, where people aren't able to grieve properly because they can't, they, 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 they can't have a funeral in the same way that we used to. So Lord, we pray for them to have comfort as well. Heavenly Father, we pray for the young people who are coming to you to understand what their purpose is in life, to understand what their future plans are in their life. They're looking for you. They're, they're looking to you for guidance. Um, we think of students who are in grade 12 who are looking to graduate and deciding which school to go to. We think of those who are graduating college, university, trying to find work, and finding work during this time is tough. And Lord, we all need guidance in our life uh, in terms of, of where you want us to be. But Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you've already given us a purpose. You've laid out a purpose for us. You know every single purpose for every single person. And ultimately, Lord, is to glorify you, to give you praise, and to enter into this loving relationship with you. So, Lord, help us to trust you during this time. Lord, we're so thankful that you are a God who strengthens and a God who heals. And we pray for strength and healing for Tyler during this time because of the issues with his blood. We pray for Tanya that you, you give her strength and allow her to have an opportunity to share the gospel with her son. We pray for Andrew, who, had, who, had, who is still recovering from his heart attack. And, Lord, we just pray that you continue to be with him and his family. We're thankful, Lord, that you are healing him and are helping him to recover. Lord, we think of those who have COVID within our midst. Um, continue to be with them in their situation. We've already seen you work mighty works in terms of COVID, in terms of other uh, issues of, of health, Lord. You've been with us in so many ways. Lord, help us to continue to rely on you. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are a God who saves. You're a God who saves us and brings us out of the, of the sin, of the life of sin that we were in. And Lord, it doesn't mean that we live perfect lives, but it means that we're able to look to you for grace every single day. And we pray for that same grace. We pray for that salvation that comes through your Holy Spirit. We pray for those who aren't saved, our family members, our friends, those who don't know you. We pray for those who are very angry against you, maybe especially during this time because of COVID. Lord, we pray that they come to know the gospel, that they come to know you in a strong and powerful way, and that you meet them where, where they are in a strong and powerful way. Lord, we pray for Pastor Alex as he preaches, as he shares about the gospel, as he preaches about the gospel. Allow people to listen to this video and to recognize that we are not saved by the people around us. We're not saved by our family members. We're not saved by our own works, but we are only saved by the grace that you provide. And Lord, help us to come to you day in and day out for this grace. Lord, we give up all these situations to you. And again, we thank you, Lord, for the God that you are, for the Father that you are. Help us to rely on you every single day. We pray all this, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Amen.
to be here with uh, people. Amen. So, and, um, this is actually the conclusion of last week's sermon, Hold Fast to the True Gospel, which is point number three. We must preach the gospel of grace. So that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 9 to 11. You know, I remember uh, when I was younger, grade 9 or grade 10, you know, I was going past uh, a bus stop and there was about 20 guys or so in the shadows and they were like, hey, hey, come here, come here. <laughs> and I remember, you know, that night I, I could have got uh, jumped or, or robbed. And I remember just walking across the street and going to the other bus stop, and I'm not even kidding, on that corner, there was four or five people just singing praise songs. So they're, in the, they're on that corner singing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing you. So I just said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang out with you guys tonight. And one of the guys started to share the gospel with me, but I was like, can you leave me alone? I go to church. Like, I don't need to hear this. I just don't want to get robbed tonight. So can I, uh, can I stay with you? And I remember getting on that bus and, and finally going to Lawrence RT station at Midland Lawrence. That's where, you know, my, my parents are still there. And I remember uh, one of the guys that was calling me over in the shadows, he, he went on that bus and he followed me to Lawrence RT. And right when I got to Lawrence RT station, I just ran. <laughs> I just ran home. So, you know, I'm just this grade 9, 10 kid. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get robbed tonight. So I just took off. And I remember later on that night, uh, my sister asked me, she said, what happened, that, what happened tonight at 10 o'clock? And I should have been at church. That was a Friday night. It was a youth group. And my sister said, at 10 o'clock, one of the youth leaders, she stopped everything. And she said, you know, let's pray for Alex. So they stopped the program on that Friday night. And they said, hey, let's just pray that God will protect Alex. And it was at that exact time when I, I could have got jumped or robbed. So I was, you know, I, I didn't tell my sister, even to this day, she doesn't know. I said, what are you talking about? But that's a story, you know, of God's grace in my life. And it was only by the grace of God that something didn't happen. And it, this doesn't mean that nothing bad will ever happen to us. That's not what the Bible's saying. But we can all share stories of God's grace. We all have stories in our lives where we can, we can say, hey, this was the hand of God. This wasn't me. This wasn't luck. This was God working in my life. That's the grace of God. And understanding as well, in regards to salvation, Scripture tells us that salvation is all by God's grace. That's why we can't boast and say, hey, I saved myself. But salvation is a work of God from beginning to the end. That's the gospel of grace. Just a recap from last week, we talked about the resurrection. There was people in the Corinthian church that, that was saying, there is no resurrection. And Paul said, if that's the case, then not even Christ has been raised and we are doomed, therefore, hold fast to this gospel, to the true gospel. 
In today's passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 to 11, talks about the gospel of grace. That the true gospel includes the grace of God. We must continue to preach this and hold on to this gospel. Misunderstanding the grace of God will be dangerous. One extreme will lead to legalism. Legalism is I earn my salvation. I will finish my own race. I'm perfect. I'm sinless. This person might say, I don't do drugs. I don't have sex outside of marriage. Therefore, I'm better than people. I can earn my salvation. But scripture is clear that even if we're angry at a brother or sister, we've committed murder. We committed lust in our hearts. We committed adultery. If you coveted something, I want your I want that mask. I want your chocolate bar. You're coveting something that's not yours. We've broken the law. And scriptures tell us that when you break one of the law, you're guilty of all of them. Galatians chapter 3. Paul talking to the Galatians says, You foolish Galatians, who has tricked you? You started your walk in faith, but now you're trying to finish it in your works and your flesh. You are deceived. So legalism says, I'm the Pharisee, it's the hypocrite. I'm better than people, I don't need grace. I can finish my own walk. The other extreme of a misunderstanding of grace is the one who abuses the grace of God. The one who says, I'm saved for eternity. I can't lose my salvation, I'm saved by grace, therefore I'm going to live in sin, unrepentant sin, no guilt. No remorse. I don't have to change. I can just indulge. Who cares? That is an abuse of the grace of God. Jude chapter 1 verse 4 says, There was people who turned the liberty and freedom of God into licentiousness, which is basically a license to sin. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 13, Paul said, You're free. The Christian is free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Use it to serve one another. So we're not perfect. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. But this is the one who abuses the grace of God. In some preaching, there's the one extreme where it's all wrath. The wrath, wrath, wrath of God. But there's no grace. The other extreme is all grace. And no wrath. It's just the grace of God. Just love, but there's no penalty. There's no wrath. If somebody comes, into, comes to your house and says, Hey, come jump in the van. Get in the van. What are you going to do? Why? I don't, need, I don't need to go in the van. What's going on? But if they told you that there's a fire next door, and that fire is going to consume your house really soon, you're going to jump in that van. You can say, okay, there, that's why I'm going to jump in the van. Now, if you go to someone's house and you just start screaming, fire, fire, there's a fire. But you don't tell them about the van. You don't tell them about the answer. You don't tell them that there's an escape. That's just the bad news. You've got to share the, the answer. And that is Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9 says, You're saved by grace, not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that you cannot boast. We are saved by grace, but we will also finish this race by the grace of God. Amen? There's some real people here. Amen. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Hold fast to the true gospel. Point number three, the conclusion, we must preach the gospel of grace, verses 9 to 11. Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul understood that he was not better than the other disciples. It's not a competition. You know, I remember in my apartment building, there was an older guy that I was always competing with. And I remember one time we were standing in the hallway with our bikes. 
And he was on his bike, and we were waiting for the elevator, and he just said, hey, look, no hands. So I don't know, he was probably uh, just leaning against the wall, but I looked at that, I said, hey, I could do that too. So I, I went on my bike, and I said, no hands, and I fell right on my head. But it's not a competition, the Christian walk. In John chapter 21, verse 20 to 25, Peter says to Jesus, what about John? What's going to happen to John? In John chapter 21, verse 15 to 19, Jesus said, Peter, this is how you're going to die. And Peter said, what about John? And what was Jesus' response to Peter? You focus upon your calling. You be faithful to your task. Don't worry about John. In verse 9, it says, Paul persecuted the church. In Acts chapter 22, verse 3 to 4, it says, he persecuted the Christians unto death. That's why he says in verse 9, I do not even deserve to be called an apostle. I am least of the apostles. He understood grace that it was undeserved. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. It is a free gift. Again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, so that you can't boast. How can we boast in grace? What Paul deserved was death. And that's for all of us. Scriptures scriptures tell us that we're all sinners deserving of an eternity of hell. Yet Christ died upon the cross, taking the penalty for our sin, but also breaking the power of sin in our lives. He rose from the grave. We were separated because of our sin. We were reconciled through the shed blood of Christ as we repent, put our trust in him. We are saved for eternity, and we'll spend that with him in heaven. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift is eternal life. A wage is what you deserve. You worked for it. In your job, you get your wages. You earned it. Clearly, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says what we have earned is death. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, There is no one righteous, no, not one. Because if we could save ourselves, we don't need Christ. We don't need the cross. But it was all God's work upon that cross. Salvation, again, is a work, from, work of God from beginning to end. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Jesus is the author and finisher of, of our faith. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, I know that God who began a good work in you will bring it onto completion. Because if it was up to us to finish our faith, we would all fail. And it's not us holding on to God, it's God holding on to us. I remember my kids walking across the street. I'm holding on to their hands. Because if it was up to them, they probably get hit by a car. They're not strong enough. In the same way, we're not strong enough. We need the grace of God. We need the Holy Spirit. John chapter 10, verse 28 says, Jesus speaking says, I will give them eternal life, and they shall not perish, and no one will snatch them from my hand. I love the hymn, In Christ Alone. The lyrics go like this. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Nothing can pluck us from the hands of God. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Titus chapter 1 verse 1 to 2. For the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. It's clear that God cannot lie. God never lies. So when he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he will be with his children forever. That's the hope we have. I remember in grade eight, there was a guy, literally, you know those guys that say, hey, you want to buy a watch? And they open up their jacket. There was a guy like that in my class. I said, okay, whatever, I'll get a watch. And every week he, he says, oh, I don't have it. And he's just, don't worry, I promise, I promise, next week, next week. And eventually I realized, this guy's a liar. But that's how people are. People lie, but scriptures tell us God never lies, cannot lie. We might say to ourselves, I deserve this salvation. 
I will finish. I don't need your grace, God. I don't need your help, God. Again, Galatians 3, who has bewitched you? You're trying to finish this in your own work. But it is by the grace that we are saved, and it is by the grace we will finish this race. Why? Again, if we could save ourselves, and if we could finish this race without God, we would look down on other people. Or we would fall into despair. Either we will be arrogant or we would give up. After I can't obey, I, I just keep on sinning. I just keep on making mistakes. I give up. But that's why we need the grace of God. And in that way, who gets all the glory? Not us. In that way, God gets all the glory. It means that we are totally dependent on Him for every breath that we take. With every breath we are saying, I need you, God. I need your grace. How do we live this life by grace? I remember a church that I went to 20 years ago. I, I shared this before, but they said live by grace. I literally had one of the teachers, one of the leaders say, you can sin. Literally, it's okay to sin. You know, just indulge in sin. You don't have to fight it. You don't have to feel guilty. Just go ahead, live by grace. That's obviously a wrong understanding of grace where there was even a brother from that church where, let's just say 10 out of 10 is what you should never do in a church. He's, he's at 100 because if your theology is, hey, I can do whatever I want, you're just going to fall into sin. To live by grace means you walk in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. So how do you walk in the Spirit? By relying upon God through prayer without ceasing, staying in the Word every day, morning and night, having fellowship continue to come out to the Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right now, again, it's a max of 10. And if you have questions, you can contact us. And just remember to contact Olga before you come. But I encourage you to come to those. Even the men's fellowship will let you know uh, more details later. You can call people, write letters. And the grace of God takes the pressure off of us. Not so that we can dive head into sin, but that, but that we have help from the Holy Spirit. That we have the grace of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 20 to chapter 6 verse 2. Paul said, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Basically, Romans chapter 5 says, the more you sin the more grace you need. It makes sense, right? The more sin that you have, the more of God's grace you need. But chapter 6, verse 1 to 2, Paul says, does that mean that we should continue in sin? Because we get more grace when we sin, does that mean we should continue to sin? He says, by no means. So how Paul had to make this clear, because that's what people were doing in Corinth. But in our day as well, that's what they are doing. That's a wrong understanding of the grace of God. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says, I was the worst of all sinners. Why? He persecuted the church. He was killing Christians. He was an enemy of God. And you might look at Paul and say, I'm not that bad. I didn't kill Christians. You know, Paul is the worst of sinners. I'm, I'm not that bad compared to Paul. But Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to 10 says, We were sinners, that Christ died for us while we were sinners. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to 10 says, While we were enemies of God, we were reconciled. So Paul said, I was the worst of all sinners. And I can echo that even for myself. I have a buddy of mine, every time he sees me, he goes, Hey, where's the old Alex? Where's crazy Alex? Where's evil Alex? And I remember there was a guy in high school who used to mock me. And he says, I know how your life will turn out. You're going to be a bum. You're going to be a nobody. You're going to be a druggie. And he was right, except by the grace of God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31 says, God chose the foolish things to shame the wise. Paul was chosen as an example of God's grace, taking the worst of all sinners. 
I'm an example of the grace of God. If you went 23 years ago and you told me one day, Alex, you're going to be the lead pastor at Long Branch Baptist Church, I would have laughed. Everybody that I know would have laughed. My family would have laughed. Because I was the last person in my youth group, maybe in the whole church, that you would think would one day become a pastor. It would have been a big joke. Well, that's the grace of God. Thinking about it now, I still get teary-eyed because I didn't earn anything. It is by the grace of God we deserved hell and death. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 to 16. Paul says, I was set apart. He was set apart before he was born to preach the gospel called by the grace of God. And the grace of God can change any heart, even the worst of all sinners. It might take time. Don't give up. If you have people you're praying for, continue to pray for them. When, I th when we think about Jonah again, he was watching the city. Maybe in his heart he said, they don't deserve God's grace. In, Roman, uh, sorry, in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, it says, that is why he ran away. When God said, go and preach repentance, Jonah ran away. And he says in, jo in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, I ran because you are a gracious God that forgives. I knew you would show grace. That's why I didn't want to preach repentance. In his heart, he may believe he deserved God's grace. But that's how we can be as well. We forget that we did not deserve this grace. It was a free gift. And that is why we must give grace to others because we did not deserve it as well. But we still call out sin, but we do it with love, mercy, and gentleness. Verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul says clearly in verse 10, it's by the grace of God. And it says in verse 10, it is without effect. You can see the impact of God's grace. It brought Paul to repentance. He stopped persecuting the church. So that's true repentance. He didn't say, okay, I'm sorry, and continue to persecute the church. He stopped persecuting the church. So you see God's grace at, at work in his life. We obey God because of the grace of God. Without effect, you can see God's grace at work in our lives. You see the fruit of the Spirit. And in verse 10, Paul says, No, I worked harder than all of them. It's not saying that he's better than the other disciples, other apostles. But it's saying you don't just sit back and do nothing. You put all of your effort into your relationship with Christ. But make this clear. Salvation, again, is all a work of God. You can't earn salvation. You can't work for it. And you can't finish it. And sanctification is all a work of God's grace. Sanctification is God working in your life by His mercy and His grace to mold you, to purify you, to grow you the rest of your life. But that does, that does not mean you don't do anything. So like, I'm going to sit back and I'm not going to do nothing. We can persevere through, this, through the grace of God. So you, you're not going to say, you know what, I don't have to read the Word anymore. It's all God. I don't need to read. I don't need to pray. But we must continue to read the Word of God, not in a legalistic way, trying to repay God for His grace, because we could never repay God for what He has done for us. But it is a response to His grace. God empowers us to live for Him. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Not through myself. I can do it through Him who strengthens me. So again, salvation is all from God. And we will finish this race by His grace. That's why we can't boast. But we must stay in word, in prayer, in fellowship. We must continue to love God with all of our hearts, our soul, and our minds. We live and we obey the commands, but not in our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15, Paul says to Timothy, Give yourself wholly to your calling. Immerse yourself. Be absorbed in your ministry. What Paul is saying to Timothy is this. Work with all of your heart for the glory of God as you do ministry. Not for the praise of man. Not for money. Not for recognition. This is not talking about just being a workaholic, being busy for the sake of being busy. But we're using our time wisely for the kingdom of God, for the advancement of the gospel that's found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. We need a balance. As we immerse ourselves in what we are called, we still still spend time with our families. We don't neglect that. We don't neglect our bodies. We still exercise. We have fellowship. We find rest in Christ. We relax in Christ. We must stay in our personal devotions, stay in the word, stay in prayer. So it is by the grace of God we are called, and it is by His grace He enables us to continue to serve Him. It's God working through us, using us. We are a vessel of God. We are an instrument of God. In that way, who gets all the glory? God gets all the glory. Amen? Amen. It's not our ability. It's not our intellect. It's not our skills. You know, we may not boast out, out loud, hey, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm better than you, but sometimes in our hearts, we can have that attitude of, hey, I'm better than people. And verse 10, it doesn't end with just, I worked harder than all of them. If you read verse 10, it says, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. By the grace of God, Paul was able to immerse himself into his ministry, to give himself to his calling, to be wholly used for God, to be absorbed in the ministry. That word grace in the original Greek, so remembering the New Testament was written in ancient Greek, that word grace in the original Greek, it has an idea of cannot earn. You cannot deserve. You don't deserve it. Verse 9 That's why Paul says, I am least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. Romans chapter 1 verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name. Obedience flows from saving faith. It is a natural outflow of the grace of God. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Verse 11, whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Paul didn't care about the credit. He says, okay, as long as the gospel is being preached, I don't care about the credit and recognition. You know, I worked in retail for a long time. You know, Eddie Bauer, Foot Locker, different places. And I remember I had one manager who was such a great manager. He didn't care about the credit or recognition. As long as they did well, he was happy. He said, wow, you're doing a great job. But I had another manager. He wanted all the credit. So I was doing well, but he'll he'll try to take all that credit. But that's how we can be sometimes, even as as believers, sometimes as humans, we, we want the credit. But Paul's saying, I don't care about the credit. Verse 11, whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 15 to 18, it says some preach with the wrong motive. And in this context, in Philippians chapter 1, they didn't like Paul. They were trying to harm Paul. But what was Paul's response in Philippians chapter 1, verse 18? He said, as long as the gospel is being preached, I don't, I don't care. So obviously we preach with the right motive. But the point that Paul is making, he's not here for the fame. He's not here for the glory. He wants to see people repent and turn to Christ and save from hell. In heaven, we're not going to be worshiping Paul. We're not going to be worshiping a man. We're not going to be worshiping a pastor or a leader. We'll be worshiping God. Verse 11 says, this is what we preach. What is, what is it that they preach? The true gospel. Remember the context of, of chapter 15. They were taking out the resurrection. And Paul says, without the resurrection of the dead, there's no no gospel. You take out the grace of God as well. In today's passage, there's no gospel. 
Therefore, hold fast to the true gospel. So again, the one extreme is just wrath, 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 sin, sin, sin. It's just bad news. There's no good news. Yes, there's wrath. Yes, there's sin. But there's also grace. There's mercy and forgiveness and love at the cross of Jesus Christ. As we repent and put our trust in him, remembering that true repentance is to turn away from our sin and turn to Christ. Again, we're not, I'm not talking about sinless perfection here, but that's not an excuse to abuse the grace of God. So again, the other extreme is just live by grace. I'm just going to indulge in sexual immorality and pornography. I'm just going to do drugs and get drunk out of my mind. Well, that's not the gospel of grace. And I mentioned legalism. Right? I earned it by my works. And Jesus, talking to the Pharisees, he says, even in your heart, if you've broken a law, you are guilty. The point is this. We all need a Savior. That's the point. Only the person who keeps the law perfectly will enter into heaven. And that is what Christ has done for us. He lived the perfect life for us. So that when we trust in Christ, when God looks at us, He sees Christ's righteousness, not our righteousness. We are no longer guilty. We are clean because of Christ. And we have all broken the law, Scriptures tell us, practically and in our hearts. And the Scriptures tell us we are guilty of punishment. That punishment is hell. But Christ died in our place. He took that penalty. He did the work, not us. He did the work. You might say, hey, I don't do all these bad things, but in our hearts, we've all sinned and we are guilty of hell. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 21 says, When sin came to the world through that one man, Adam, death spread to all men. In Romans chapter 5, verse 15, it says, Through one man's sin, we're all condemned. Through one man's sin, sin has reigned throughout everyone. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Through the one trespass, it led to condemnation for all people. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Because of one man's sin, we are all sinners. So scriptures tell us that we have inherited this guilt from Adam. Because of Adam's sin, we are found guilty as well. Scriptures tell us there is no one righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And because of Adam's sin, scriptures tell us, we also inherit a sinful nature. Which means that we are born with this sinful nature. I think Calvin said it best. He said our hearts are like idol factories. Always in our hearts, we're constantly pumping out new idols. And because of our fallen nature, our hearts are naturally always looking to sin. We have a natural tendency to rebel against the law of God. Even as believers, as long as we're in this flesh, we will struggle with the sinful nature. So one, it is clear from Scripture we have inherited the guilt from Adam. That's found in Romans chapter 5. But also, we have inherited a sinful nature. We always want to sin. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful. Beyond all cure it is desperately sick. There is no cure for our hearts except Jesus Christ and the grace of God. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. The, lo- the, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. We need the grace of God, amen? Because we have inherited the guilt, but we also inherited sinful nature. We sin because we are sinners. So we can't save ourselves. We can't finish this race in ourselves. If it was up to us, we would be doomed. We would be hopeless. We need a Savior. We need the grace of God, and that humbles us every day. I remember a buddy of mine growing up, he said, You know what? I don't need Jesus. I don't need the grace of God. I'm going to jump the fence. I said, what are you talking about? He said, when I die, I'm just going to find the back door, like a club, and I'm going to jump into heaven. Don't worry. It's like, I don't think that's how it works. And when we get to heaven as believers who repent to put their trust in him, we're not going to be high-fiving. Yes, we did it. I did it. We made it on our own effort. 
but we're going to be on our knees weeping before Christ, worshiping him because it is clear that we were guilty of sin, that we didn't deserve God's grace. We didn't deserve to be saved and forgiven. What we deserved was hell. We'll be crying with joy, worshiping God. Even the most confident Christian, they're not going to be in the corner of heaven going, small, shake my head. Pff, look at all those guys crying, <laughs> worshiping at his feet. Mm. They're not going to be doing that. They're going to be on their feet in tears because they will realize they didn't deserve anything by the grace of God. Verse 11, whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. Again, this is the true gospel, which includes the grace of God. In summary and in closing, hold fast to the true gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 11. Point number one, we must remind ourselves of the gospel, verses 1 to 2. Point number two, we must pass the gospel onto the next generation, verses 3 to 8. Point number three, we must preach the gospel of grace, verses 9 to 11. The gospel of grace says we were under the wrath of God, deserving of hell, yet God sent his son who lived a perfect life, died upon the cross, who rose from the grave, who's sitting at the right hand of the Father, who is the true ruler of the universe and is returning. It's not about trying harder or trying to earn your salvation, but it's about full surrender, complete control to God, relying upon the Holy Spirit and not your own strength. Therefore, we need the grace of God, and this humbles us but gives us hope. I want to encourage you to turn to Christ. Time is short. Make that decision before it's too late and continue to pray for your loved ones. We are thankful that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is with us for those who repent and put their trust in Him. He's with His child forever. God is with His child forever. Even in our darkest times, we have hope because of the grace of God. Because we can so easily be deceived. Let us stay in the Word, the whole counsel of God. Read the Old Testament. I encourage you to also read the New Testament with that. I'm encouraged by Will Petruski, who actually moved to Alberta this past week or the week before, hearing stories of how he was just reading, devouring the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. He's just continuing, continuing to read. Let us continue to do this as well. And even when we're 100 years old, let us keep reading because how easily we can be deceived by a false gospel. You know, my wife Jess, she has a photo photographic memory. She knows how many dishes were in there two hours ago. So if I add a dish, she can say, hey, there was five dishes in there three hours ago. She's a great memory. Or, you know, sometimes I eat, I'm trying to stay away from chocolate bars, but once in a while I eat a chocolate bar and I'll stuff the wrapper down in the garbage. But she'll look at the garbage and say, hey, wait a second. The garbage was moved in a certain way, and she'll find my wrapper. She has a great memory. But we don't, not all of us have that photographic memory. And how easily we forget the sermon from last week. How easily we forget what God has been teaching us the other day. How easily we forget the Word of God. So let us continue to memorize, meditate, read the Word of God. And in COVID... Again, in this situation, don't forget to reach out to people. I was talking to Jeffrey, Pastor Rob, and Patty's son the other day, and he told me he's written 25 cards this month. So praise God. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this time. Thank you for your grace, O oh God. That we did not deserve this, Christ, yet you died for us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we end our service this morning, we're going to be singing about a song, or we're going to be singing a song that I think perfectly encapsulates what the gospel is. Uh, when you read the chorus, O victory in Jesus, my Savior forever, he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me before I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Let's pray. Let's sing together.
just thank you so much once again for this time. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us, that we were deserving of hell, yet Christ, you died upon the cross for us. Thank you for your grace, and thank you that we have eternity in your name. No more pain, no more sorrow, but we will spend eternity in paradise with Jesus Christ as we repent and put our trust in you, Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're with us, even in our darkest times, even in the midst of what's going on right now. You are with us. That God, you will never leave us nor forsake us. You will never leave your children. That Christ, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help us to trust in you, to stay in the word, stay in prayer, and all the glory goes to you, O oh God. Once again, this is not a performance for man, but this is to, to worship you, and to lead people to Christ, to edify the body. You get all the glory, you get all the spotlight, get all the credit. And God, we pray not our will, but your will be done. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.